Hello and welcome to another teaching from 119 Ministries. Our ministry believes that the whole Bible is still true and directly related to our lives today. If you would like to know more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. Recently, a brother in Christ by the name of Mike Winger made a video critiquing our theological position concerning God's law. Mike is a pastor and Christian apologist who has done great work in the area of apologetics, that is, answering objections to God and the Bible. And we're truly grateful for the opportunity to engage with this thoughtful critique of our position. At 119 Ministries, we do not normally produce video teachings directly responding to any individual or organization. However, Pastor Mike spent a great deal of time expressing some concerns to 119 Ministries, and we felt as though that a kind and heartfelt response was appropriate, and perhaps beneficial to those interested in how we might respond to Pastor Mike's concerns. It provides an opportunity to clarify misperceptions or misunderstandings that would not serve well to leave unaddressed or ignored. While we certainly differ with Pastor Mike on a number of issues, we were pleased to see how much we actually agree on. So, before we begin, we wanted to highlight the common ground that we share, and then we'll respond to the points he brought up where we differ. Here's what Pastor Mike had to say toward the end of his video. Hey, if you believe you're saved by faith alone, truly believe it, you're my brother and sister in Christ. I just think you got some theology wrong here. And if you are part of the Hebrew Roots Movement and you have fellowshipping with you, people who, do not, who deny the gospel of salvation by grace, you need to separate yourself from those people. Um, regardless of whether or not you keep the law. You've got to separate yourself from those people. It's a major, major issue. We want to thank Pastor Mike again for his reasoned arguments, and especially with the kindness in which he presented them. With regard to this statement from our brother Mike, we give a hearty amen. We affirm what the scriptures clearly teach in regards to the gospel, that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ, not by our works. And we also agree 100% that to deny this fundamental truth is heretical according to scripture. Pastor Mike himself says, 119 Ministries says very clearly in their videos, you are, you are not required to obey the law in order to be saved. So they treat it as a non-salvation issue. They think it's an obedience issue. While Pastor Mike later goes on to say that he thinks we contradict ourselves on this point, which we'll address in a moment, we want to make this absolutely clear. Pastor Mike and 119 Ministries fully agree on salvation. Where we differ is what happens after one has entered the plan of salvation. Where we differ is our understanding of what it looks like for followers of Christ to live out the word, or to walk as Christ walked, like John says. How are we, as followers of Christ, supposed to live? Is the law of God applicable to us today? And if so, what does that even mean? If you follow our ministry, you know that we take a different position than most Christians when it comes to observing certain commandments, such as the Sabbath or the dietary instructions found in Leviticus 11. We will discuss that a little later, but first we wanted to highlight a couple other areas of agreement. Toward the beginning of Pastor Mike's video, he stressed the fact that he loved the Law of Moses, and he doesn't want to unhitch from it. He's not anti-law, he says. It's wonderful to hear such positive affirmations from Pastor Mike towards God's law. We agree when he says that this debate is not about whether Christians are against God's law. The debate is concerning the application of God's law. We would submit that we are already largely in agreement with most Christians concerning the application of God's law. For instance, most Christians agree that we should be observing the law with regard to things like adultery, murder, stealing, caring for the widow and orphan, etc. All of that is part of God's law. Even those Christians who promote an anti-law position don't really believe what they say. All faithful Christians believe we should obey God. The debate is over the extent of what that means. So, in a moment, we're going to quickly make a case for our position. And then after that, we're going to offer a rebuttal to some of the points of disagreement in the video. But first, a couple of things. Pastor Mike accused us of being emotionally manipulative in the particular teaching of ours that he critiqued, which was the Pauline Paradox series, part one, is the majority ever wrong. 
In our teaching, we made a few statements about how some Christians may feel like something is missing. Pastor Mike felt like those statements were too salesman-y and we were playing with people's emotions. This is an understandable criticism from his perspective. What we were referencing were the many discussions we have had with people as well as our own personal experiences. All of us at 119 Ministries have shared that same experience as well because we also all once came from a mainstream Christianity perspective about God's law. After coming to a new appreciation for the Torah, these Christians, like ourselves, told us that they felt like they had found what they had been missing, that the Holy Spirit was leading them to this revelation. They told us how the scriptures had become much more alive, simplified, and meaningful. It is hard not to be excited about that, or at least comment on that pattern of experiences in our day-to-day exchanges with others. However, Pastor Mike's criticism is duly noted. We agree with him that we ought to base our theology on the truth of the scriptures, rightly interpreted, not on emotions. In fact, that is how the rest of the Pauline Paradox series continues, focusing on the scriptures. So as we proceed with this response, we're going to do our best to make a logical case based solely on the scripture. Pastor Mike also felt that we set up several straw man arguments in the way that we defined words like truth and the word. He accused us of reading our philosophy into the scriptures rather than letting the scriptures speak for themselves. Again, we appreciate Pastor Mike's criticism and we're happy to leave that for our viewers to decide as we hope they too test everything and not rely on anything that any man says. Instead of quibbling over these minor points regarding our presentation from a past teaching, we're going to make a case based on a simple exegesis of the scriptures before giving our rebuttal to Pastor Mike's theological objections. That, of course, is the heart of the matter. So, how does the law of God given through Moses apply to New Testament Christians? Well, Messiah Yeshua, that is, Christ Jesus, gives us a direct answer to this question in his famous Sermon on the Mount. This is what he says. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We unpack this passage further in our teachings, Heaven and Earth and the Law of God, and Plerau, the Law. But just looking at the plain text, we can determine a few things. Number one, Yeshua didn't even want people to think that he was against the Torah, the Law of God, in any way, or that he came to abolish it, that is, render it obsolete. According to the Messiah's own words, rendering God's law void is not what he came to do. Number two, Yeshua said that his followers would continue to do and teach even the least of the commandments in the Torah. If commandments like the Sabbath or dietary instructions were about to become inapplicable to believers in light of the new covenant, Yeshua wouldn't have encouraged obedience to the least of the commandments. Number three, Yeshua said that even the smallest part of the Torah would pass away until heaven and earth pass away and all is accomplished. According to scholars, and we would agree, this is a reference to the eschaton, the end of our age. So at least until the eschaton, even the least of the commandments of the Torah remain applicable to believers. Here is how New Testament scholar Dr. David L. Turner puts it. The phrase is, until heaven and earth disappear, and until its purpose is achieved, refer to the end of the present world and the beginning of the eschaton. Until that time, the law is valid. Matthew 5.19 goes on to infer from 5.18's statement of the perpetual authority of the law that it had better be obeyed and taught by the disciples of the kingdom. It would be hard to make a stronger statement of the ongoing authority of the Torah than is made in 5.18. Number four, finally, 
Yeshua said that members of the kingdom of heaven are identified as those whose righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. In context, that is righteousness with regard to the law of Moses. This is just a simple exegesis of the passage. We're not reading anything into this. Yeshua's direct answer to the question of God's law is that it remains applicable to believers. Saying that he came to render certain commandments inapplicable goes directly against his own words when he says that he did not come to do that. It goes against his imperative to do and teach the least of the commandments and to surpass the scribes and Pharisees in righteousness. Put aside the question of the law for a moment. Are these instructions from our Messiah applicable to us or not? Because if the Messiah's instructions here are relevant to us, then we already have our answer to the law question. It seems that the only response one could make to this clear statement from our Messiah is to say that his words were relevant only to his direct audience, that is, first century Jews, before Yeshua's death and resurrection. We're not accusing Pastor Mike of making that argument, but that objection is often made. The immediate logical problems with the objection are numerous. For instance, why would Yeshua make a point to affirm the authority of God's law and encourage his followers to do and teach it if parts of it were no longer going to be applicable soon thereafter? It just doesn't make any sense. In either case, we're curious what Pastor Mike's interpretation of Matthew 5, 17 through 20 would be. We certainly don't want to misrepresent him, but there's something he does say in his video that leads us to believe that he thinks these instructions from the Messiah applied only to Jewish believers. By the way, by the way, the law of Moses, it never, ever, ever applied to Gentiles as something they were all supposed to do. Never. So let's ask the question. Does the Messiah's teaching in Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 20 apply to Gentiles or not? The majority of mainstream Christianity agree that Yeshua's Sermon on the Mount is especially relevant to believers today. And this statement from Yeshua affirming the ongoing authority and applicability of God's law is the foundation of that famous sermon from our Messiah. So, is this small part of the Sermon on the Mount applicable only to the Jews and only for a short time before Yeshua's resurrection? Again, the Messiah himself answers this question for us. We don't have to start with any presuppositions or read anything into the text. Here's the commandment Yeshua gave his disciples after his resurrection, just prior to his ascension. Matthew chapter 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Yeshua said that we are to teach all nations, not just Jews, to observe all that he commanded his disciples. Is Yeshua's Sermon on the Mount included in all that he commanded his disciples? Of course. Therefore, Messiah is imperative to make disciples of all nations includes teaching them to do and teach even the least of the commands from the law. When we read the rest of the New Testament in light of these clear, unambiguous statements from our Messiah, we are not starting with our own philosophies or presuppositions as Pastor Mike asserts. We are starting with a plain reading of Messiah's statements on the topic of God's law. Starting from that framework, we shouldn't be surprised when we see the apostles doing exactly what the Messiah commanded them doing and teaching the law of God. In Acts chapter 2, we see the disciples celebrating the Feast of Shavuot, which is consistent with the commandment. In Acts chapter 10, verse 14, several years after Messiah's resurrection, Peter declares he has never eaten unclean animals, showing his commitment to the dietary instructions in the Torah. In Acts 13, 17, and 18, over and over again, we see the apostles keeping the Sabbath every seventh day. In Acts chapter 20, verse 26, we see that Paul was so committed to keeping the feast days of the Bible that he was in a rush to make it back to Jerusalem to celebrate Shavuot. In Acts 21, 20 through 24, in Acts 24, verse 14, Paul defended himself against false accusations that he taught against the commandments of the Torah. In 1 Peter 
Peter instructs Christians to be holy in accordance with the Torah, which he then quotes as the basis for his imperative. Interestingly, in the passages Peter quotes from, being holy is defined as including observance of the Sabbath, feast days, and dietary instructions. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7-8, the Apostle Paul instructs Christians at the Church of Corinth in how they ought to observe Passover and unleavened bread. And it is interesting to note, the Church of Corinth was made up primarily of Gentile believers. But wait, there is more. The New Covenant writes God's law on our heart through the work of the Holy Spirit according to Jeremiah 31, 33 and Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. And Paul confirms this prophecy in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 4, when he tells us that God gave us his Holy Spirit in order to empower us to keep God's law. So walking according to God's Holy Spirit, according to Paul, causes us to obey God's law. Interestingly enough, Paul is simply teaching exactly what the prophet Ezekiel teaches in Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. There are many more examples we can give, but again, the plain reading of all these passages confirms our position. There's no reason that the apostles would continue to do and teach the Sabbath and feast days and dietary instructions if those commandments became inapplicable to Christians. That's not to say that there aren't confusing passages on this topic that seem, on the surface, to conflict with our view. But when we take a closer look at those passages, in light of what we just established, it's easy to see how everything is in harmony. As we demonstrate in our teachings on Romans, Galatians, Colossians, and so forth, the apostles never taught that these commandments from God's law are inapplicable to Christians. Just the opposite, in fact. As we move forward, we're now going to offer a response to Pastor Mike's specific theological objections to our position. The first point we're going to address is his comments on Hebrews 7. Here's what he says. But Hebrews 7 verse 11, it says, Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. Oh, I should uh, put it on your guys' screen as well. Oh, I did. Good. Um, Okay, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Now here's the logic. This is I love this book. Hebrews is great. The logic is 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 thoughtful though. It's not simplistic. It's thoughtful. He's saying in Psalm 110, long after the Levitical priesthood is given, there's a prophecy about a future priesthood. And so he's like, hey, if the Levitical priesthood was doing the job, if there wasn't going to be a change of the priesthood, then there'd be no prophecy of a whole different kind of priesthood. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I have a whole video on that. You should check it out. It's really good. Um, but that's that's what he's doing. Hebrews is not saying, here's my new teaching. Hebrews is saying, here's the old teaching. It's always been this way. And then he goes on. So after he's established the idea that there's a new priesthood coming, verse 12, he says, for when there's a change in the priesthood, there's a, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. So then there's this change in the law. Do you catch that? The the change in the law is not that the law changes where we're going to go back and edit the Old Testament. No, 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 no. We're saying the Old Testament itself, God's revealed word to, to the Jewish people, it had embedded in it a change that was going to take place when this new priest shows up. It's a new priesthood, and therefore, it's there's a different law, a greater law, so to speak. Just as there's a new covenant, there is a new commandment. And so, um, anyway, there's a lot more to talk about there. But here's a, a biblical term where the term change is used. And it's used not in the sense of altering the text, but fulfilling it and bringing about um, new application. That's the idea. A change in application. New covenant, new priest, new law. And that's based on Old Testament passages in Psalm 110, um, as well as uh, other places. Pastor Mike is right that Hebrews 7 is a complicated chapter that requires some deep thinking. But is he right when he says that this passage speaks of a new application of the Torah, which, in Pastor Mike's mind, entails the literal application of commandments like the Sabbath have changed? In other words, has the literal application of the law to rest on the seventh day taken on some different meaning, negating the literal application? We don't think so, 
Here's why. The goal of the author of Hebrews in this chapter is to explain to his readers how Yeshua is able to be a legitimate priest according to Scripture. The Torah requires priests to be sons of Aaron. So, Yeshua doesn't qualify as a priest on the basis of his physical lineage because he is not of the line of Aaron. So the author of Hebrews finds a basis for Yeshua's priesthood outside of the Levitical line in the person of Melchizedek. Throughout his epistle, the author of Hebrews uses midrashic methods of interpretation, which can often be confusing to modern readers who are unfamiliar with rabbinic logic and reasoning. For instance, the author argues from silence to support his conclusions. That is to say, if the scriptures don't specifically say something about a person or event, certain determinations could be made based on the silence of scripture. This is very common in Jewish literature, and it can sometimes be difficult to wrap one's mind around. But here's a very simple breakdown of the author of Hebrews' argument. Number one, Yeshua cannot be a priest according to the Torah, since the Torah requires priests to be from the line of Aaron. Number two, Yeshua is not a priest within the Levitical system in an earthly tabernacle. He is a priest of a heavenly tabernacle. Number three, there are specific Levitical laws that pertain to the earthly tabernacle that do not apply to the heavenly tabernacle. Number four, therefore, the Torah does not restrict Yeshua from being a high priest. Number five, in fact, there is a biblical precedent for this. As evidence, the author of Hebrews offers Melchizedek, a priest who is also beyond the Torah's restrictions pertaining to the Levitical system. Number six, we are told that Melchizedek was a king and priest, just like Yeshua. Since scripture says nothing about his genealogy or death, the author of Hebrews then infers that his priesthood continues to this day in the ongoing priestly work of Yeshua the Messiah. Number seven, Melchizedek was not a son of Aaron. His priesthood existed before Aaron. In fact, his priesthood is greater than that of Aaron since our father Abraham, from whom Levi is descended, gave a tithe to him. Remember, collecting the tithe is a responsibility of the priesthood. Number eight, Yeshua is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He doesn't need to be from the Levitical line to be a priest. In fact, his priesthood was before Levi and greater than Levi. So with that framework in mind, let's look at these critical passages as it relates to God's law. Hebrews chapter 7. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. When believers read in the book of Hebrews that Yeshua is a heavenly high priest after the order of Melchizedek, many of them automatically assume that the earthly priesthood has been replaced. But that's not what the author of Hebrews is saying. He can't be saying that, otherwise he'd be contradicting scripture in other places. He would even be contradicting himself when he says that the Messiah cannot be a priest on earth. For instance, the apostles continued to participate in the Levitical services long after Yeshua's resurrection. Here are just a few examples. Acts chapter 2. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Acts 3. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Acts 21. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. And of course, let's not forget the author of Hebrews himself, who recognized the ongoing service of the Levitical priesthood in Jerusalem. Hebrews chapter 8. Now if he, Yeshua, were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, 
See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But wait, there's more. Both Ezekiel and Zechariah acknowledge the reality of a future earthly priesthood, temple, Levites, and animal sacrifices after Yeshua's second coming. So surely the author of Hebrews is not saying that the Levitical priesthood and earthly tabernacle have been replaced in light of Yeshua's priesthood. The Levitical priesthood served a valid, ongoing purpose, and it will serve that purpose again in the future millennial reign of Messiah. In addition to conducting the earthly tabernacle services, the Levitical priesthood paints a picture of the gospel and Messiah's priestly work in the heavenly tabernacle. So then, what is the author's point in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 12? Basically, as he says, the Levitical priesthood could not attain perfection. What does that mean? As scholar J.K. McKee explains, the source text employs the term teleosis, meaning a completing, perfecting, fulfillment, accomplishment, the event which verifies a promise. The perfection that our author is speaking about is this state of people being totally and completely reconciled to their Creator. This was a state that was simply unattainable in the Levitical system, because sacrifices had to be continually offered before the Lord for the propitiation of sins. This does not necessarily make the Levitical priesthood bad or even imperfect, because the Levitical priesthood was surely given and established by a God who is perfect. It does, rather, make the Levitical priesthood incomplete and unable to bring about the complete perfection that is to be established in the lives of God's people. The sons of Aaron are human. Therefore, they have weaknesses. They sin. They grow old. And eventually, they die, which means they cannot continue their duties. The earthly priestly system is made up of sinful humans whose sacrifices, which are made year after year, cannot fully reconcile mankind to God. Only a sinless and immortal heavenly high priest can accomplish this. Yeshua is that heavenly high priest of a greater and perfect priesthood, and He is the only one who can truly make atonement and reconcile us to God. The Levitical priesthood is the shadow that points to the reality. It's a symbol, but the fact that it serves as a symbol does not take away from its value and purpose. To make a comparison, the same could be said about things like baptism. Baptism is merely symbolic of deeper spiritual truths about the gospel. But no Christian believes that this symbol is worthless or should be discarded. Pastor Mike believes that with the establishment of Yeshua's heavenly priesthood comes a different law, a greater law, he says. But the author of Hebrews doesn't say that. First, such an interpretation is impossible since the author twice appeals to the prophecy about the new covenant which he writes the Torah on the hearts of God's people. If the Torah is now replaced, then why does the author affirm the prophecies about it being written on our hearts? Moreover, even if we assume that this passage is saying that the sacrificial system has been replaced, it still wouldn't follow that commands like the Sabbath, feasts, and dietary instructions have been replaced. That would be an overstatement since the context is dealing only with the priesthood, not the rest of the law. Evangelical Old Testament theologian Walter Kaiser agrees. It would be wrong to think that just because the sacrificial system had been replaced, therefore the whole law, including the moral law of the Decalogue, the Holiness Code, had likewise been superseded and replaced. Even if we grant Pastor Mike's premise that the Levitical priesthood has been replaced, his conclusion that literal commands like the Sabbath have been replaced with a different application simply doesn't follow. But again, there's no reason we should even grant Pastor Mike's premise since the author does not say that the Levitical priesthood has been replaced. Think about it. The very fact that the author of Hebrews makes it a point to explain how the Messiah could be a legitimate priest makes sense only if he considers the Torah to still be applicable to all in the faith. In summary, the author's argument in Hebrews is that the Levitical laws do not restrict Yeshua from being a priest, since Yeshua is not a priest on earth. Because he is not a priest on earth, the laws governing the earthly priesthood do not apply to Yeshua's priesthood in the heavenlies. Remember, there is a difference between the earthly and heavenly tabernacles. 
the earthly tabernacle functions as a symbol pointing to the heavenly tabernacle. Yeshua's priestly work within the heavenly tabernacle works within a different system than the Levitical system. Being from the tribe of Levi is a requirement to serve in the earthly tabernacle, but it is not a requirement to serve in the heavenly tabernacle. The primary qualification to serve in the heavenly tabernacle, according to the author of Hebrews, is the power of an indestructible life. And of course, Yeshua, following his resurrection, now meets that qualification. Thus, the author of Hebrews explains to his audience that Yeshua can be our great high priest, despite not being descended from Levi, because he's a priest of a different priesthood, and thus there is a different law, or change of the law, as the author puts it, governing the heavenly tabernacle when compared to the law that governs the earthly tabernacle. But the law governing the earthly tabernacle is still in force, on earth. That's why the author of Hebrews says in chapter 8, Now if he, Yeshua, were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, Torah. Just to drive this point home, here's an analogy that might help us better understand what Hebrews 7.12 is saying. There are different laws governing civil leadership depending on the country. For instance, if someone living in the United States were an immigrant from Canada, they would not be allowed to become President of the United States. Why? Because the law governing the office of the President of the United States requires you be a natural-born citizen. But if that same person moved to Canada, they would not need to be a natural-born citizen of the United States to enter into the office of the Prime Minister. It's a different office of civil leadership in a different location. Canada's requirements are different than America's requirements. Thus, in this case, when there is a change in the office of civil leadership, there is a change in the law governing civil leadership. Notice the parallel of wording in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12, pertaining to a different priesthood in a different location. What does that mean? America's law for the office of the president does not apply to a citizen of Canada. However, the same citizen moving back to Canada does not change the law of America. It just means that the law of America, as it pertains to the presidency, does not restrict a citizen of Canada as it pertains to the office of prime minister. In the same way, there are different priesthoods and thus different criteria for being a priest depending on which priesthood you're part of. If Yeshua were on earth, he would not be allowed to be a priest without being a son of Aaron. But if he ascended into heaven to represent the heavenly tabernacle, he would not need to be a son of Aaron to be a priest. It's a different priesthood in a different location. Thus, when there is a change in the priesthood, there is a change in the law governing the priestly office. Why? Because the priesthood locations are different. What does that mean? The earthly priesthood's laws don't apply to a priest in the heavenly tabernacle. However, Yeshua's position as priest in the heavenly tabernacle, of course, does not change the law of the earthly tabernacle. It just means, as a priest in the heavenly tabernacle, Yeshua is not restricted by the laws of the earthly tabernacle. Obviously, with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, there is no way for the earthly priesthood to properly function in Jerusalem right now. But according to biblical prophecy, after Yeshua returns, that priesthood on earth will be re-established, as we explained earlier. Both priesthoods, the heavenly and the Levitical, are valid and can even function simultaneously since each applies to different office parameters. The author of Hebrews makes that very point by stressing the fact that there are already priests on earth who function according to the Torah. So Pastor Mike's conclusions based on Hebrews 7 have some obvious problems. While not intentional, and we mean this with all due respect, he makes both of the author of Hebrews and Scripture itself contradict themselves. The interpretation that we've just given is much more consistent within Hebrews and the rest of Scripture. The author of Hebrews clearly affirms the ongoing authority of the law as being written on our hearts through the New Covenant, and he affirms the ongoing service of the Levitical priesthood along Messiah's heavenly priesthood. One does not replace the other. The earthly served and will serve again as a symbolic shadow of the heavenly reality.
Let's move on to Pastor Mike's next objection. Everyone, including Pastor Mike, agrees that believers shouldn't practice sin. That's not to say that we'll be completely sinless in this life, but followers of Messiah will strive to live a life that is characterized by obedience to God. But we apparently have some differences with Pastor Mike when it comes to what sin is. We've proposed in past videos that sin is clearly defined in places like 1 John 3, 4 as transgression of God's law. This would mean breaking the fourth commandment to rest on the seventh day, for example, is considered a sin. However, Pastor Mike disagrees. He interprets 1 John 3, 4 differently. Here's what he says. Because this word lawless that I have highlighted right here, lawlessness, it doesn't mean the law of Moses. That's why it's not translated. Sin is breaking the law of Moses it's because that's not what it means. It's a word namas. It just means, or anamas. It's, it's the negation of the law. But, it, but the word namas doesn't mean of the Old Testament or law of Moses. It just means law. And it's frequently used even in the New Testament in ways other than referring to the law of Moses. It has a variety of uses. You can look them up on your own. There's a variety of uses here. But in order for the um, the Hebrew Roots movement, you know, to kind of be correct here, they have to take one usage and act like it's the only use. Before we unpack 1 John 3, 4, it should be pointed out that this verse isn't the only place in the New Testament that defines sin as breaking the law of Moses. Consider Romans 7, 7, for example. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Here, Paul is clearly referring to the law as given through Moses. Nobody disagrees with that. Paul then references a particular commandment that he read from the law of Moses, you shall not covet. And he recognizes that he came to know what sin is as a result of reading the commandment in the law. Paul recognizes that coveting is a sin because the law says not to covet. Romans 3.20 is another verse that defines sin in relation to God's law. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Again, the Torah reveals the sinfulness of man. It defines God's standard of right and wrong. And so we come to knowledge of sin through God's law. So even if Pastor Mike is right about 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, he still has Romans chapter 3, verse 20, and Romans chapter 7, verse 7 to contend with. But let's look at 1 John 3, 4 for a minute. First, lawlessness is anomia in the Greek. As scholar Tim Hegg points out, John makes it clear to us that sin is defined as lawlessness. This Greek word, anomia, is the word regularly used to translate the Hebrew word Torah in the LXX, the Septuagint, with a prefix alpha, which is the equivalent to our English prefix un in a word like unlawful. Thus, anomia could just as accurately be translated into English as no Torah, in the sense of against Torah, or negating Torah. The attempts of some to interpret anomia as in a general sense, unwillingness to submit to law, disregards the obvious use of the term throughout the LXX, a use which must be taken into consideration when seeking to know how the word is used in the apostolic scriptures. Pastor Mike's complete dismissal of even the possibility that this verse is in reference to the Torah is without basis. When we just look at the words themselves in this verse and how they're used, there is plenty to warrant interpreting this verse to be in reference to God's law given through Moses. In fact, that would appear to be the most obvious conclusion. Pastor Mike later explains what he thinks 1 John 3, 4 means. Here is what he says. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, it will tell us exactly what John meant when he talked about obeying his commands. And this is the commandment that we, that ye, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. That's the commandment. I believe in him and I and we love one another. So this is the commandment John's writing to you. It's not the old law of Moses being recommanded to the rest of the world in the name of Jesus Christ. Rather, it's love 
and faith, faith and love. This is, this is the commandment. It's very simple. Um, but if you assume lawlessness means rejecting the law of Moses, instead of looking at it in context and realizing this lawlessness is just talking about general unrighteousness, general living a life that you're not yielded to the goodness and, and righteousness of God, um, then, then you're going to create the problem. Uh, but not, not from a, a study of the text. Pastor Mike has created what is called a distinction without a difference here. He dismisses the plain reading of the text in 1 John 3, 4 and defines lawlessness as just a general unrighteousness. But he doesn't really substantiate that as something separate from God's law. God's law defines righteousness and unrighteousness as we showed earlier. Righteousness means following the Torah, following the right ways of God. Pastor Mike seems to be imposing his own understanding of righteousness onto the text rather than letting Scripture interpret itself. Pastor Mike then points to 1 John 3, 23-24, and he suggests that John is simply telling his readers to obey the commandment to love each other in some general sense. This, again, is a distinction without a difference. God's law commands us to love our neighbor. And earlier in the chapter, there is an imperative to not practice sin, which is defined as lawlessness. It seems to us that Pastor Mike is the one taking verses out of context. He should read verses 23 through 24 in light of the plain reading of 1 John 3, 4, rather than imposing his own understanding of loving your neighbor onto the text. Not only that, but what does John mean when he tells us to love our neighbor? Well, John tells us what he means. 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 through 3. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Loving our neighbor is not some vague thing in the Bible. John clearly points us back to the commandments of God. There is simply no textual basis for creating a distinction between God's law and his commandments, especially when John directly references God's law in 1 John 3, 4. In our review, we found that those were Pastor Mike's big objections to 119 Ministries and or Hebrew Roots in his video. Again, we appreciate Pastor Mike engaging with our arguments, and we certainly respect his knowledge and perspective. His position used to be our position at one time. However, we think it's clear that Scripture is on our side when it comes to this topic. There's one last thing we want to clear up before we end. Pastor Mike expressed a reasonable concern about something we've said in one of our teachings about apostasy. Here's what he says. What he's done is he's walked you to a place where, and I mean, I listened to that clip multiple times because I just want to make sure I really understood what he was saying, where you have only a couple options, right? Option one, um, you don't obey the Old Testament law, but you're just ignorant. You're ignorantly rejecting the Torah. Um, um, it's less blessings for you. It's sin, but you can be forgiven for that. That's condition number one. Condition number two, option number two is you knowingly reject the Torah, which means that you're actually rejecting Jesus and you are now apostate. You're like, you're lost. You're apostate. Then he says this, by the way, condition one's not available for you anymore because I just explained to you that you do have to keep the Torah. Implication? Either you keep the Torah or you're apostate, you're rejecting Jesus. Now I have a serious problem. Now they, now, excuse me, let me put it this way. Now 119 Ministries has a serious problem. Now whoever believes this has a serious problem. You have just moved into the place where you've made obedience to the Torah, the, the, um, the salvation issue, um, which is, I don't know how you can read the Bible and get that. The issue of apostasy, or rejecting God and walking away from the faith, is a sensitive subject for all believers of all denominations and theological perspectives. We're going to quickly explain our position on the topic, and hopefully this will resolve some of Pastor Mike's concerns, as well as anyone else who might have misunderstood what we meant. To begin, here is how Got Question Ministries defines apostates according to Jude. Jude describes the apostates as ungodly and as those who use God's grace as a license to commit unrighteous acts. The first point we'd like to make is that nobody accidentally becomes apostate. No believer just happens to reject the Messiah and walk away from his or her faith. 
Apostasy is a willful choice within the heart of the individual. As Got Questions puts it, they use God's grace as a license to commit unrighteous acts. So every Christian believes that apostasy is connected to licentious behavior. That is, the apostate lives a life of complete disregard for God's will and God's ways. With that in mind, here's what we'll say. A sincere believer in Christ who desires to live a life pleasing to God, by definition, cannot be apostate. So how does that play into the topic at hand regarding these disputed commandments within most of Christianity, the Sabbath, dietary laws, etc.? To put it simply, if a believer does not keep a commandment like the Sabbath because he or she is convinced through the scriptures that it isn't required of them, but they love God with all of their heart, they desire to please Him, and they are committed to obeying Him in what they know to be true, they are not apostate. They are faithful followers of Messiah to the best of their knowledge and ability. And that, we believe, characterizes the vast majority of faithful Christians, like Pastor Mike, who would disagree with us on this topic. We think they're wrong, but this is a theological disagreement we have among brothers. Faithful Christians, who are unconvinced of our position, are not in willful rebellion against God. They're just doing the best that they can, like we are. We certainly don't claim to have all the answers either. We're just doing the best we can with what we believe to be true. Now, on the other hand, if a believer is convinced through the scriptures that the Sabbath is applicable to them, and they utterly refuse to obey, dumbing their nose at God, because ultimately they don't care to live a life pleasing to Him, well, we would say, according to scripture, they are on thin ice. We explain our position on this matter in depth in our teaching, the least the greatest, and the defiant. Ultimately, it's not our place to judge someone's salvation. Only God knows the hearts of man. But these warnings are in Scripture for a reason, to cause us to examine ourselves, to make sure our heart and lives are in alignment with God. None of us have all of the answers, and we're all wrong about some things. But it's important that we do our best to honor God to the best of our knowledge and ability. Once again, we want to thank Pastor Mike for engaging us on this important topic. We look forward to more discussions. We pray that you've been blessed by this teaching. And remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. It is because of you, our generous supporters, who make it possible to offer these high-quality teachings completely free of charge. If you feel led to support 119 Ministries so that we can continue this effort, please visit testeverything.net and click on the Support 119 tab. Learn how you can partner with us to take the whole Word of God to the nations.